a very good morning to everyone the lecture for the today's session is regarding shoulder joint so before dealing about the shoulder joint let's know about what is shoulder joint complex which consists of basic four articulation that is glenohumeral joint acromioclavicular joint sternoclavicular joint and scapulothoracic articulations in the glenohumeral joint we'll go through the type articulating surface ligament relations bursa movements blood supply and the nerve supply of the shoulder joint as well as the applied anatomy of shoulder joint introduction the shoulder joint is most movable joint of our body and one of the least stable that's why dislocation occurs here type ball in socket type of synovial joint articulating surface proximally or medially with the glenoid cavity distally or laterally with the head of the humerus we can make out here in the diagram this is medially and this is laterally with the glenoid cavity and the head of the humerus both the articulating surface is covered with the help of hyaline cartilage let's know about glenoid cavity and head of the humerus this glenoid cavity it is pear shaped shallow it means it is not that much concave while the head of the humerus is convex the glenoid cavity is small and the head of the humerus is large so only one third of the humeral head comes in contact with the glenoid cavity at any position let's know the term congruent congruent means both the articulating surface it can be medially or laterally or proximal or distal is having exactly same size and shape it means in the shoulder joint due to the shallow glenoid cavity and the large convex head of the humerus the congruency of this joint is not maintained so dislocation of this joint occurs more glenoid fossa is depend by the fibrocartilaginous rim of the glenoid labrum so that head of the humerus can be fitted properly in the glenoid cavity you can see here in the diagram this is known as the glenoid cavity while this is known as the large head of the humerus ligaments of the shoulder joint so we have the fibrous capsule glenoid labrum glenohumeral ligament coracohumeral ligament transverse humeral ligament and some of the accessory ligament that is coracoacromial ligament and the arch is formed that is known as coracoacromial arch let's know about capsular ligament also known as joint capsules you can make out here in the diagram this green color is indicating a uh, joint capsule or capsular ligament so it is a thin fibrous layer which surrounds the glenohumeral joint like a envelope attachment medially it is attached to the glenoid neck at a variable distance from the glenoid labrum and supraglenoid tubercle thus enclosing the long head of the biceps laterally it is attached to anatomical neck of the humerus except inferiorly where it extends downwards 1 to 1.5 cm or more on the surgical neck of the humerus we can make out here in the diagram this is known as the the glenoid cavity and this is known as the neck of the glenoid cavity but this is known as the head and this is known as the surgical neck of the humerus where the fibrous capsule is attached and laterally you can see that the fibrous capsule extends 1 to 1.5 cm downwards near the surgical neck of the humerus the synovial membrane lines the inner surface of joint capsules the features related with the synovial membrane that is present in anterior aspect and the posterior aspect anteriorly we can make out here in the diagram it forms the tubular sheath around the tendons of biceps brachii where it lies in the bicipital group of the humerus that is opening between the two tubercle near the fibrous capsules and again anteriorly it also communicates with the subscapular bursa between the shoulder joint and the tendon of subscapularis that is below the coracoid process in the posterior aspect it communicates with the infraspinatus bursa that is between the shoulder joint and the infraspinatus muscles we can make out here in the diagram this is subscapular bursa anteriorly this is posteriorly that is infraspinatus bursa and this is the synovial sheath which is covering the tendon of the biceps brachii glenoid labrum it is a fibrocartilaginous rim attached around the margin of the glenoid cavity which is triangular in section 
it also continues with the long head of the biceps because the long head of the biceps is originated from the supraglenoid tubercle of the scapula and the function of the glenoid labrum it helps to increase the depth of the fossa for the articulation of the shoulder joint and protects the edge of the bones you can make out here in the diagram this is known as the glenoid cavity and this margin you can see here that is known as the glenoid labrum and even you can see here in the diagram this glenoid labrum is attached to the margin of the the glenoid cavity and it also includes the supraglenoid tubercle glenohumeral ligament these are the three thickening in the anterior part of the fibrous capsules or we can say that it is derived from the fibrous capsules which is only visible from the interior aspect of the joint which helps to provide the support to the capsules from anterior and inferior aspect so there are three glenohumeral ligament which is known as superior middle and inferior glenohumeral ligament let's know the attachment of all the glenohumeral ligament superior glenohumeral ligament medially it is attached to the supraglenoid tubercle just anterior to the origin of long head of the biceps laterally it is attached to the humerus and fovea capitis near the proximal tip of lesser tubercle on the medial ridge of the intertubercular sulcus middle glenohumeral ligament medially it is attached below the superior glenohumeral ligament along the anterior glenoid margin as far as inferior third of glenoid labrum laterally it is attached to the lower part of lesser tubercle that is deep to the tendon of subscapularis muscles inferior glenohumeral ligament it is complex hemoclike structures so medially it arises from the anterior middle and posterior margin of glenoid labrum and laterally it is attached to the inferior and medial aspect of the neck of the humerus you can see that this is known as the superior this is known as middle and this is known as inferior glenohumeral ligament coracohumeral ligament it is a strong thick band like structure which provides support to the upper part of the capsular ligament and to the shoulder joint attachment it arises from the base of the coracoid process and extends as two bands which blends with the capsules to the anterior aspect of the greater tubercle and the lesser tubercle of the humerus you can see here in the diagram this is known as the coracohumeral ligament which is attached to the coracoid process and to the lesser and greater tubercle of the humerus transverse humeral ligament it is a broad band of fibrous tissue which connects the two leaves of upper part of intertubercular sulcus or the bicipital group and act as a retinaculum to keep the long tendon of biceps in proper position you can see here in the diagram this is known as the bicipital group this is known as the lateral leaf of bicipital group medial leaf of bicipital group and the long tendon is passing deep to the transverse humeral ligament and it is kept in a proper position with the help of the retinaculum that is known as transverse humeral ligament coracoacromial ligament it extends between coracoid process and acromion process let's know about coracoacromial arch which is formed by coracoid process acromion process and in between the ligament that is known as coracoacromial ligament it forms a protective arch for the head of the humerus above and prevents its superior displacement above the glenoid cavity we can make out here this is known as coracoacromial ligament which is attached to the coracoid process and to the acromion process bursa related to the shoulder joint subscapular bursa it lies between the tendon of subscapularis and the neck of the scapula which protects the tendons from friction against the neck next is subacromial bursa it lies between the coracoacromial ligament and acromion process above and supraspinatus tendon and the joint capsules below it is one of the largest synovial bursa in the body and which facilitates the movement of supraspinatus tendon under the coracoacromial arch the next is infraspinatus bursa it lies between the tendon of infraspinatus and posterolateral aspect of the joint capsules we can make out here in the diagram this is known as the the bursa that is known as subscapular bursa subacromial bursa and on the posterior aspect that is infraspinatus bursa let's know the relation of the shoulder joint from the superior aspect the relations are the acromion process 
subacromial versa, supraspinatus muscles and the deltoid muscles. Same how from the anterior aspect, the relations are anterior fibers of the deltoid, corocobrachialis muscles and short head of the biceps, subscapular bursa, subscapularis muscles, pectoralis basal muscles. From the posterior aspect, it is related with the posterior fibers of deltoid, infraspinatus muscles, teres minor muscle. Now the inferior relations, it is related with axillary nerve, long head of the triceps and posterior circumflex humeral vessels. Blood supply of the shoulder joint, it is supplied by anterior and posterior circumflex humeral vessels, suprascapular vessel, subscapular vessels. Nerve supply is done with the help of the axillary nerve, musculocutaneous nerve, suprascapular nerve and by the lateral pectoral nerve. Factors providing stability to the shoulder joint, the factors are long head of biceps, glenoid labrum, coracoacromial arch and the cordman's musculotendinous cuff also known as rotator cuff. We can see here that these four muscles is forming the musculotendinous cuff mostly known as SITS muscles that is supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor and subscapularis. So the tendons of these four muscles get fused with the underlying capsules of glenohumeral joint. The function of musculotendinous cuff Tone of the rotator cuff muscle grasps the relatively large head of the humerus and hold it against the smaller shallow glenoid cavity, helps the head of the humerus rotating against the glenoid fossa during motion, which is termed as rotator. The movements of the shoulder joint, the movements are flexion, extension, adduction, abduction, medial rotation, lateral rotation, and one more that is known as circumduction. The main muscles and the accessory muscles helps in the movements of the shoulder joint that is known as synergist. So many muscles acting together to do a particular type of action that is known as synergist. So flexion is done by pectoralis major, deltoid, biceps brachii, corocobrachialis, pectoralis major, extension, deltoid, latissimus dorsi, teres major, long head of triceps. Adduction is done by pectoralis major, latissimus dorsi, teres major, corocobrachialis, short head of the biceps, long head of the triceps. Abduction is done by deltoid, supraspinatus, serratus anterior, upper and the lower fiber of the trapezius. Middle rotation is done by subscapularis, pectoralis major, latissimus dorsi, deltoid, teres major, while the lateral rotation is done by deltoid, infraspinatus and the teres minor. Let's know about mechanism of abduction. So the total range of abduction is nearly 180 degree. Abduction up to the 90 degree occurs at the glenohumeral joint. That is from 0 to 15 degree to 90 degree. Abduction from 90 degree to 120 degree can occur only if the humerus is rotated laterally. Abduction from the 120 degree to 180 degree can occur if the scapula rotates forwards on the chest wall. So let's know in detail that supraspinatus initiate the abduction up to 15 degree that is 0 to 15 degree further from 15 degree to 90 degree abduction is done with the help of the the middle fibers of the deltoid in fact spinatus and teres minor rotates the humerus laterally to overcome the impingement of the greater tubercle against the coracoacromial arch Contraction of the upper and the lower fibers of trapezius and the lower five digitation of serratus anterior rotates the scapula and assist in abduction, while the middle fibers of the trapezius helps to stabilize the scapula during ad abduction. Scapulohumeral rhythm. Up to 30 degree abduction is predominantly in involves the shoulder joint. 30 to 180 degree involves both shoulder joint and scapula rotation. The scapula and the humerus move in the ratio of 1 is to 2. When the arm is abducted 180 degree, 60 degree occurs by the rotation of the scapula and 120 degree by the rotation of the humerus at the shoulder joint. So we can see here 2 degree movements takes place near the glenohumeral joint and 1 degree rotation takes place or the movement takes place near the scapular thoracic articulation. Applied anatomy related with shoulder joint, dislocation, 
ह्यूमरल हेड इज होल्ड इन अ प्लेस बाय द रोटेटर कफ मसल्स दैट इज एस आई टी एस सबस्कैपुलरिस सुपरा स्पाइनेटस इंफ्रा स्पाइनेटस एंड टेरिस माइनर मसल्स ह्यूमरल हेड सेपरेटेड फ्रॉम द स्कैपुला एट ग्लिनो ह्यूमरल जॉइंट ड्यूरिंग द डिसलोकेशन कॉमनली डाउनवर्ड डिसलोकेशन बिकॉज रोटेटर कफ मसल्स प्रोटेक्ट्स द जॉइंट इन ऑल डायरेक्शन एक्सेप्ट फ्रॉम द इन्फीरियर एस्पेक्ट इन द हेमिप्लीजा पेशेंट it is more prone to dislocate their shoulder because their rotator cuff muscles are weak to hold the shoulder joint in the proper place axillary nerve is mostly damaged in the inferior dislocation of the shoulder joint adhesive capsulitis is also known as frozen shoulder so during the adhesive capsulitis there is pain and stiffness seen in the shoulder joint shoulder capsules thicken and become tight stiff band of the tissues is seen that is known as adhesions which is developed during time of adhesive capsulitis in many cases there is less sensible fluid seen in the joint unable to move your shoulder either on your own or with the help of someone else stages of the adhesive capsulitis freezing frozen and the thawing in the freezing the pain is worsened day by day shoulder loses the range of motions typically last for 6 week to 9 month in the frozen painful symptoms may actually improves during this stage but the stiffness remains during the 4 to 6 month of the frozen stage daily activities may be very difficult in the last that is thawing shoulder motion sl- slowly improves completely return to the normal or close to the normal strength and the motion typically takes from 6 month to 2 years rotator cuff disorder the rotator cuff disorder includes calcific supraspinatus tendonitis the rotator cuff muscles is commonly injured during repetitive use of upper limb above the horizontal level example in throwing sports swimming and weightlifting the deposition of calcium in the supraspinatus tendon is common the calcium deposition irritates the overlying subacromial bursa causing subacromial bursitis consequently when the arm is abducted the inflammated bursa is caught be- between the tendons and acromion impingement which causes severe pain in most people pain occurs between 60 to 120 degree of abduction that is known as painful arc syndrome the rotator cuff disorder usually occurs in male after 50 years of age we can make out here in the diagram this is rotator cuff tear rotator cuff bursitis rotator cuff tendinopathy and this is known as painful arc syndrome there can be slap lesion slap means superior labrum anterior and posterior in the slap injuries the superior part of the labrum is injured as we can see here in the the diagram the top area is also where the biceps tendons is attached to the glenoid labrum slap tears occurs both in front that is anterior and back that is posterior of the attachment point the biceps tendon can be also involved in the injuries as well